That is for you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We are live. Okay. So, welcome everyone to the launch of where is it? Camp Quilt Bag. Yes, yeah, yeah. Very happy to welcome Nicole and AJ back to the Bureau, or Andrew, back to the Bureau. Uh, they were here about a year ago, right? Yeah. Um, so we're super glad that they could make it back. And we're glad you all came out on a cold, rainy day to be in this warm space together. Um, so my name is Greg Newton. I am the co-founder of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division, along with my partner, Dom Jokum. Um, Max Nazario is the volunteer helping us out today, and we are an all-volunteer organization. The explanation for our long name is that we are a government agency for a government that does not yet exist. And this is the service that we provide. It's holding this space for queer culture. So we have regular bookstore hours Wednesdays through Sundays from 1 to 7 p.m., um, often we stay open later when we have an event in the evenings, but we also do a lot of weekend events that usually take place around three o'clock. Um, so as a volunteer organization, we are always asking for donations. Donations and book sales are how we keep this project afloat. Uh, so we have a suggested donation of $10, but please give whatever you can, if you can. And if you'd rather support us by buying a book, that is a perfectly legitimate and wonderful way to support. So I'll pass this around. You can also Venmo us at BGSQB, those letters that are all around you. And there's change in there if you need it. So thank you so much. Um, I don't think I said this already, but if you're not on our email list and you would like to be, you can sign up for that at the back of the room and you'll get an email every other Monday about our upcoming events. And we keep a pretty busy calendar here at the Bureau. Um, so before I introduce Nicole and Andrew, I want to read a brief land acknowledgement, and then we'll get started. So the Bureau acknowledges that our organization operates on the unceded land of the Muncie Lenape. We are actively seeking to partner with and provide material support to a local queer indigenous organization. And we hope to make an announcement about this partnership in the near future. But in the meantime, we encourage you to join the Bureau in signing up to make a monthly donation to the American Indian Community House's Manhattan Fund. The Manhattan Fund, according to its website, is an invitation to all settlers and non-Native people who wish to acknowledge the legacy of theft and genocide that comprise the history of New York City and the United States. And you can find out more about that at manhattanfund.org. So, Nicole Mellaby, she, her, is a New Jersey native, is the author of highly praised middle grade books, including the Lambda Literary uh, finalist, Hurricane Season, and a, a notable book, How to Become a Planet. She lives with her wife and their cats, whose need for attention oddly aligns with Nicole's writing schedule. <laughs> How polite. Uh, visit her online, um, NicoleMellaby.com. A.J. Sass, he, they, is the critically acclaimed author of the ALA Rainbow Book List Top 10 titles, Ellen Outside the Lines, which was also a Sidney Taylor honor book, and Anna on the Edge. He grew up in the Midwest, came of age in the South, and now lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with his husband and two cats who act like dogs. <laughs> Visit him online at sass, I -N oh, sass in SF, that makes sense, <laughs> dot com. Please give them a very warm welcome. Great. So, hello, Andrew. Um, Hi, Andrew. Do you want to? We'll start. We'll do a reading. Will we should read. Should I read first? Is my chapter? Yeah, I shouldn't read my first because mine's chapter two. Oh, um, yeah. Yes. Um. So we'll do a quick reading. We're each. So for Camp Copag, um, our 
chapters alternate. I write, I wrote for Abigail, Andrew wrote for Kai. Um, I'm going to read Abigail's first chapter now. Abigail found the website herself. It was a very un-Abigail-like thing to do. She had a bad day at school, weren't they all bad days ever since Stacy had stopped being her friend, and came home, traded her school uniform skirt for sweatpants, and did what she did always did on bad days, took out her laptop to watch interviews of her celebrity favorites on YouTube, mostly Laura Dern, or Terry Polo, or some other older actress, usually at least over 40, who was pretty enough to steal Abigail's heart that week. She sort of had a thing for older ladies. It sort of got her into all this trouble in the first place. She couldn't enjoy the YouTube interviews that day. She tried. She pulled up an old Jurassic Park interview and Laura Dern said something silly and Abigail blushed at the sound of her laughter. And she had such a bad day at school that even just blushing in the privacy of her bedroom was, well, embarrassing, really embarrassing. Abigail couldn't explain it, but she felt the tips of her ears get warm and her shoulders tensed and inched up her neck and she couldn't enjoy Laura Dern anymore. Not when all the kids at school had been making fun of her for weeks for having stupidly admitting to having a crush on Stacy's mom. Nice job, Abigail. No one needed to know about that. But now they all did know. Stacy had stopped inviting Abigail to hang out because she said it was now super weird. And honestly, Abigail didn't blame her. It was super weird. It was even weirder when Abigail realized that she not only missed hanging out with Stacy, but she also missed seeing Stacy's mom. You're hopeless, Abigail, and now you have no friends. It was kind of a double-edged sword that summer, that summer break was nearly here. Because yay, no more school where she could have bad days, but also, oh no, no friends to make summer plans with. Stacy and the other girls would all go to the beach and the boardwalk without inviting her, and they would all post pictures all over social media, and Abigail would not be in a single shot. That was what Abigail was thinking about when she closed YouTube and pulled up Google and typed, how do I find LGBTQ friends? That too felt kind of embarrassing. Who used Google to find friends? <laughs> Abigail was definitely hopeless, was definitely alone, and definitely had no real people skills whatsoever. She was seriously considering asking her mom to send her to a convent or something to escape being such an awkward excuse of a human in such a cruel, cruel world when she saw it on the third O page of the Google results. Camp Quilpag. <laughs> she clicked the link. Camp Quilpag, according to his website, was a two-week camp for LGBTQ plus youth in Minnesota which was definitely delightfully far, far away from Abigail's friends, ex-friends in New Jersey. The very top of the page had a quote from a former camper that said, Camp Quilpag felt more like just a summer camp. It felt like coming home. There were pictures of kids in rainbow colored shirts, smiling arms around each other. The description said it had activities just like any other camp, obstacle courses, swimming, kayaking, archery, and one specifically for LGBTQ plus kids, workshops on gender identity and expression, body image and self-esteem, LGBTQ plus history, and drag makeup. It sounded terrifying. Abigail was just Abigail, and the kids in these pictures were all smiles and dyed hair and cool, colorful clothes. The kids in these pictures looked totally out and totally proud and probably never got embarrassed. But it also sounded perfect because those kids were probably never got embarrassed and, were pro and probably were totally out and proud. And maybe Abigail could learn how to be too. Maybe they'd understand her crush on Stacy's mom and Laura Dern and Terry Polo and all the other beautiful women in the world. So she clicked on the more information link and filled out her mom's email address and then hit send before she could stop herself. She had a minor panic attack and major regret immediately afterwards. It wasn't that her parents didn't know, but there was knowing and there was knowing. <laughs> there was a difference between, oh, Abigail has crushes on actresses and Abigail wants to go to gay camp. <laughs> Not to mention the fact that she wouldn't exactly be able to tell a single soul at school she'd be spending her summer at gay camp of all things. Though, in fairness, it wasn't like she had anyone to tell right now anyway. But it wasn't like she could take it back now either. She sped out of the room and down the stairs to where her mom was sitting in the living room, but all she could do was stand there, eyes wide, watching it unfold, like realizing the jello was wiggling and knowing a T-Rex was about to show up, but really, how well could you run from it now? Abigail's mom was basically glued to her cell phone, and Abigail had the pleasure of making it to the room just in time to hear a buzz with a notification of an incoming email. Abigail pressed her lips tightly together, holding her breath. Is this something you're interested in? Her mom asked. No, maybe. So <laughs> <laughs> for $2,000 to attend, her mom responded, which was a lot of money. Abigail knew that from how intensely she studied the website in the first place. 
but her mom and dad paid for Catholic school every year because they wanted Abigail to have a foundation of faith or whatever. They could spend on, <laughs> if they could spend the money on something they wanted, they could send it on something Abigail needed, right? Don't be selfish, Abigail. If it's too much, I don't have to, she said. You clearly want to, her mom said. I don't know that I understand all this, and I need to look into this camp a bit more, but if it's important to you, you need to let us know. Abigail took a deep breath, and in her second very un-Abigail-like move, she admitted, it's important to me. Three, le three weeks later, she fortunately wasn't packing to be sent away to a convent. She was packing for a long plane ride to Minnesota to spend two weeks at Camp Quilt Bag. She packed her favorite Laura Dern poster and her favorite Jurassic Park shirt. She searched her clothes for something colorful to bring, but came up empty. She hoped she'd come home wearing rainbows. She hoped she'd come home feeling out and proud, not even a little bit embarrassed. Even though right now she was still kind of embarrassed. She hadn't told anyone at school where she'd be going this summer. She lied and said she was spending the summer at her family's lake house in upstate New York, who had been Abigail's, uh, who had been Abigail, oh wait, sorry, Stacy, who had been Abigail's best friend basically her entire life, who knew full well that Abigail's family didn't have a lake house, nor did she have family that lived in upstate New York in general, had stopped giving Abigail the cold shoulder solely to ask her a million questions about it. Abigail just kept lying. Well, I'm sure you'll post a lot of pictures for us to see, Stacy had said. Yeah, of course, it's so beautiful there, Abigail had lied. She'd worry about the lies later. She hoped it would all sort itself out. Abigail, as she zipped up her suitcase and headed downstairs, ready for her parents to drive her to the airport, hoped most of all that she'd make at least one friend who would understand her. Her Kai. <laughs> Chapter two. Kai stared out the car window from behind the driver's seat, frowning. He studied the skyscrapers of downtown Minneapolis, then the older brick buildings along the outskirts of the city as they traveled north. Here, the homes were newer, more uniform, and looked a lot like the one Kai's family lived in farther south. In the front of the car, Kai's parents chatted about the weather, humid for this early in June, about some work project her mom had that was due soon. She was a marketer, whatever that meant. <laughs> and when they should start looking for the highway <laughs> in half an hour, give or take, between the 221 and 222 mile markers. Don't you think, mom asked? Absolutely, dad replied, his voice superficially bright. Seems like a sign if ever there was one. Kai kept quiet, only half listening as he stared at the trees, homing in on the occasional movement of a bird or a squirrel, looking anywhere except a seat to air right. There, an orientation packet lay open to a glossy spread featuring grinning kids. It felt like they were mocking him. Kai, sweetie? Kai jerked at the sound of mom's voice, and a dull ache prickled down their shoulder. He shot a quick glare at the sling holding her arm in place, then looked up. Sorry, what? Your father and I were just saying how nifty it is that this camp is on Shakopee Lake Road. Kai could imagine a bare minimum of 50 things niftier than some road in middle of nowhere Minnesota staring a name with their hometown. But her mom was giving them such a hopeful look. Okay. Kai chewed on her lip. Normally, her younger sister Lexi would chatter with her parents on their road trips, but she left for swim camp last week. Now it was just Kai and the orientation packet with all its happy kids in rainbow colors. Camp quilt bag, a safe space to be yourself, exclamation mark. Kai didn't see why he couldn't just be himself back home. Instead, her parents were sending him someplace where he wouldn't know anyone, all because a few kids at school last year had a problem with Kai and their pronouns. So dumb. It feels like a sign, dad said again, don't you think, Kai? I guess. Kai knew he was being difficult, that her parents were just trying to be supportive, but he was fine. He definitely didn't need to attempt camp quilt bag to figure out her identity because he already knew it. Kai Linguist, former gymnast turned parkour wizard, almost eighth grader. Pronouns and identity were only a small part of them. It wasn't Kai's fault that, uh, that, that that's what everyone else focused on. He slouched in her seat and let mom and dad continue talking. Kai couldn't help wishing he was back in the real shock of pee as they passed mile marker 204. He slipped her phone out of her pocket, eyeing the notifications. Nothing from Cece or any of their old gymnastics teammates, but that wasn't a shocker. They'd all been pretty quiet since the incident that started this whole, let's send Kai to camp he doesn't want to be at business. There was a group of texts from Leo, last year's parkour team captain. Loneliness washed over Kai as he read the reminder that next week's practice plus an upcoming event was happening two weeks from now. Most of their teammates lived a few towns away from Kai and attended a different school. So practice and events were the only times he got to see them. Kai wouldn't have been able to participate in the event due to her shoulder, but he still could have gone to the gym and spent time with their friends between now and then. 
He wouldn't know anyone at Camp Quebec, so it felt a lot like he'd be starting from scratch. Kai had already started over when he quit gymnastics, and he wasn't eager to do it again, now that he'd already found a group of supportive friends. The second text was from another parkour friend, Queen Aziza. Hey, King Kai, are you there yet? The corners of Kai's mouth twitched up. Kai, in like 10 miles, have you figured out how to teleport and save me yet? <laughs> Sweetie, your mom was looking back at him again. You promise you'll give this a try for your dad and me? The entire drive, both mom and dad have been acting all bright and positive. It reminded Kai of the smiles he used to practice with Cece before gymnastics meets. He'd eventually gotten so good at looking confident, it was impossible to tell what was real or faked. Her mom's and dad's forced expressions were a lot more obvious. But now mom's tone was less upbeat, more pleading. Her brows pinched toward the bridge of her nose and a worry line wrinkled her forehead beneath blonde hair that matched Kai's own. As much as this camp felt like a punishment, Kai knew her parents were just trying to find a good balance between letting them do her own thing and showing that they supported them. That's what Kai's therapist kept saying anyway. Kai had learned to visualize positive outcomes with their therapist since coming out last year, but he still couldn't imagine meeting anyone like Aziza at camp. Two weeks just wasn't enough time to build that kind of trust. It was too late to turn back now though. Throat tight, Kai nodded. Plus she said I could leave early, right? Next Friday instead of Sunday so I can go to Aziza's parkour event? Mom sighed. We said we'd think about it. Let's see how you settle in at camp first, all right? Kai didn't reply. We will definitely make a decision before the beginning of the second week, Dad promised. Try not to worry about it until then. Besides, you might realize you're having so much fun that you'll want to stay through the end. Not likely. But Kai stayed quiet as Dad kept talking. Just give it a chance. If you really don't want to stay, you can let us know at the end of next weekend and we'll get you early. How's that sound? It sounded like Kai and her parents weren't on the same page, that they were reading completely different books, actually. Still, there was no point in arguing now that they were almost there. Okay. Mom's worry line disappeared. She sat back in her seat just as they drove past mile marker 220. Not long now, pal, Dad said, and Kai's chest clenched a little. The car slowed down after mile 221. Beyond it, another sign came into view. It said Shakopee, just like back home, except not even close because of the added lake road. I really do think this will be a great experience, Mom said, as Dad turned off the highway and onto the gravel road. Maybe I'll even meet other parkour fans. As long as you don't actually do any parkour, Dad chimed in. The car bumped along the gravel road, jerking them all against their seatbelts. Kai's shoulders twinged. Kai's shoulder twinged again. I get to take this off in like three days though, right? Hopefully, Dad said. We'll see what the camp nurse thinks. And that doesn't mean you'll be able to do all the tricks you used to do before those awful boys. Kai's stomach twisted as mom paused. Before you got injured. A wooden arch appeared, painted like a rainbow. Dad drove under it, then parked at the end of a row of cars. Mom hopped out first and hurried around the car to open the door for Kai. My other arm's fine, you know, Kai said. I can open doors myself. I know, Mom smiled. I just wanted to give you your first goodbye hug. Kai leaned into her, cheeks hot. Last year, her face would have been buried in Mom's shoulder, breathing in the perfume she always wore, vanilla lavender. Now, her chin almost cleared it, giving him a clear view past her. Kids hopped out of their cars. Some were hugging their parents, just like Kai. A few waved or called to campers they seemed to already know. Others headed out of the parking lot toward a group of kids and adults who'd formed a line in front of a sign-in table. Dad patted Kai's back, and her stomach performed a flip that would have made half her parkour team jealous. Ready, pal? Kai didn't honestly know, but he'd promised to try, so he forced a smile and nodded his mom hand over her suitcase. I guess we should start off with explaining the origin of Camp Quebec. Um, so Andrew and I have been red friends for a while. We met, when was that? 2018. In 2018, I was um, the mentor of a program called Pitch Wars, and Andrew had submitted what ended up being his debut on, a, on the edge. Um, and he got an agent before I could pick him to be my mentee, so it didn't matter anyway. But um, we ended up, we talked a lot while I was, you know, reading his work and considering him as a mentee, and we ended up just kind of hitting it off and being friends. Um, and then I was the co-editor of an anthology called This Is Our Rainbow, back, um, 
and Andrew is a contributor. Um, and we knew at that point that we wanted to co-write something, but we didn't know what we wanted to co-write. And all of the characters in the short stories in This Is Our Rainbow are on the cover and the back cover. And our characters are next to each other on the back cover. Um, kind of like coincidental. Yeah. Just for that. And they just looked so cute together. And those characters are Abigail and Kai. So we were like, let's let's figure this out. Um, but we had to figure out because Kai was in Minnesota and Abigail was in Jersey. So it was, you know, how do we get these kids together in summer camp? Yeah. Um, speaking of, it's Shakopee, because I've been saying Shakopee. Yeah, it's Shakopee. Okay. Right. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so do you want to maybe talk about what it was like to co-write a book with me? <laughs> <laughs> well, John, it was fun. Um, but yeah, so we, we sold this book on proposal. So we wrote six chapters. So basically three Abigail, three Kai, and a little synopsis that explained where we were going with this to prove we actually had a plot in mind. <laughs> and then suddenly the editor was like, great write the rest. So, so we alternated chapters, but we did work from an outline, like I mentioned. And um, Nicole's and my process are very different. Um, Nicole gets an idea and is like, all right, I'm going to write this and be done a week from now. I get an idea and I think about it for like two or three years. And then I write the first chapter and I'm like, this is all wrong. I started in the wrong place. Maybe this isn't the main character. And I thought it was, you know, stuff like that. So we were on deadline. So that forced me to actually like, make some decisions faster. I think it maybe forced you to slow down a little bit, but it also it forced me to speed up. And we kind of, we spent the summer of 2021, I wrote almost two years ago already, but publishing is very slow. But yeah, we, we kind of alternated back and forth. And um, it was like every other week, we would each do a chapter. Or actually the way we were working, because you're much faster than me, is it would take me a week to write a chapter. I would send it to her Sunday night, wake up Monday morning, she'd have a chapter back to me. Uh, so I was really just me writing chapters every week and her doing it on Monday morning. But, <laughs> but there was a lot of texting back and forth because some of you may have been here last year um, when I was in conversation with her for her other book, um, The Science of Being Angry, but that was the first time we met. And at that point, we were already done drafting camp quote bags. So, we were thinking maybe we'll do a tour, so maybe we should meet up first to make sure we actually like, like each other. other. <laughs> um, but yeah. yeah, it was it was a lot of texting. Neither of us really like Zoom or phone calls. We are both millennials, so we hate the phone. Don't want to talk on the phone. Um, a lot of a lot of texting. Yeah, in Google Docs. <laughs> yeah, I copied some of our texts, just the initial one, and I think it felt like forty pages of just <laughs> us back and forth coming up with ideas. And it was like we should probably save this so we don't have to search through our texts to find those answers later on. But. Yeah, because one of the things that's also different about our process is that I am what they call a pantser. I write it to my pants. I don't plan, but for something like this, we needed to plan, and Andrew's much better at planning. So having to like actually think about the book as a whole was very new to me. Um, so that was challenging for me, probably more so than, than the uh, actual drafting of it. Um, but it was really nice to have an outline and just yeah, to I'm also stuck to it too. Which yeah, I did not do on one of my other books. I wrote <laughs> on my own where the outline no longer reflects anything. So it was nice. It mostly stayed the same. I think. When I updated it, um, so I'm that type of person that I felt like I needed it updated just so that I had it. Um, there were a couple scenes where we flopped a couple things, and that was specific to the fact that every chapter is written either from Abigail's point of view or Kai's. So sometimes the things that I wanted to have done, Nicole had to write into her chapters that have it done. Yeah, and, that was interesting. Yeah. I know even while we were writing, there were certain things that you were like, I really want to tackle this, but I don't know where in my chapters. And, you know, to find places in, in mind to be able to do that. Like there was, um, there's one, a, a camper, Oren, who is Jewish, and Andrew wanted to have this character talk about what it's like to be queer and Jewish. Um, he comes from an Orthodox Jewish yeah. uh, community. Um, and he couldn't find a place to do it in, in his. Um, so there was a moment where I was able to have this character have a conversation about it with Abigail, um, who comes from Catholic school. So they were actually able to have this conversation in, about faith and sexuality in a way that probably wouldn't have happened as organically. No, I don't think so in a Kai chapter, specifically too, because Kai comes from an interfaith family. 
their mom is reform Jewish and their dad is Lutheran, I believe I said, uh, Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I was very interested in Lauren and like Lauren was wearing a kippah and I knew that meant Jewish probably, but but he doesn't really have a background in faith that Oren had. So I think having this conversation with Oren in a Kai chapter would have been very focused on Kai and Kai's experiences. And I think we would have lost something that we gained by having it be an Abigail chapter. Yeah, so that was that was probably the most interesting. I think when you looked at an outline and in the nature of us going back and forth, because we did, I read a chapter, Cindy can read a chapter, and then so you kind of would see where you're at in that outline and see kind of, okay, well, what comes next? What do I need to do in my chapter? What can I actually let Andrew tackle in his? And a lot of that definitely came down to the fact that we were good good friends and we trusted each other as writers because otherwise, I mean, it might have been weird to trust someone for the scene, you know, a scene like that with this character talking about Judaism. Um, I'm not Jewish, obviously. And I think that I had to text you a lot of questions like, I don't, I don't know what what is a little Jewish hat called. Like, <laughs> you know, being like, you know, not church, but then, but it worked because Abigail was coming from the same place as me. Um, so I was able to talk to Andrew and learn from Andrew, filter it through Abigail's perspective, and kind of come out with this this conversation that um, between the two. And the way it worked with character building was that so both of these characters are in separate cabins. The cabins are split up um, by groups of four. So Kai had. Or Kai's cabin was sorry. I should look at it. It's purple. Purple. It used to be green. I'm sorry. It was. Um, here's a fun publishing fact. It was green, but because there's so much green on the cover, they asked us to change. Yeah, and Nicole, after we sold that, said very excitedly bought a yellow and a green shirt, but I can't get full bag written on it. So. If you see the inside flap and you notice that I'm wearing a purple shirt, it is my husband who photoshopped it purple. <laughs> but um, maybe one day I will buy a purple shirt. I just have not yet. So that's, I guess, some behind the scenes magic publishing. Um, but yeah, so I created Kai's purple cabin. I'm going to say green like several times before in advance. Um, very ingrained. So I had Juliana um, as part of his. Uh, cabin and Oren and Jax, and then you created. Yeah, in my cabin, I had Abigail, Cassidy, Bryn, and Sick. Yeah. Um, so we each kind of created those characters who were in our cabin. But besides, you know, the main characters, the other characters we ended up sharing amongst all of yeah. our. Um, so we had to kind of, I would develop them, but then we kind of run them together, which was yeah. an interesting process, also, I think. So the development of the way they spoke, their backgrounds, their pronouns and identities, things like that kind of fell on whoever had created the cabin uh, in the first place. And then when we were in scenes where I was writing some of, um, I almost called you Abigail, um, Nicole's <laughs> characters, um, Nicole would take a closer look at those scenes and, and kind of do track changes, tweaks. So I could see how the wording would change based on how she knew the narrative what should be for these characters. And then I tried to absorb that for future chapters so there'd be fewer changes, but we kind of did that with the other way around too. Yeah, yeah, which was probably, I think, the most interesting just to see, like, to take a character that someone else had created, even like when I'm writing, you know, if I was writing Kai, to have someone else's character but have to write them myself. And like, this in this moment, this is my chapter, these are my characters, even if, you know, Kai is, is yours. Um, and to kind of be able to have that freedom to to write a whole chapter and write a scene with these characters in it, but still respecting your development um, and you know adding to it and, and helping these characters grow. So that was I think that was challenging, but also really rewarding. It was fun. It was a different type of storytelling than I'd ever done before. Um, outside of non-publishing things, I used to do like play by post role playing, the back and forth of the posts, and some collaborative fanfic and stuff, but. That's what I loved about it is it felt like that, except we were being paid for it. And we were paid for fanfic, so it was great. <laughs> yeah. Even just like with published, you know, when you're when you're writing a book, and I, I know some of you are you know, aspiring writers and such, it can be it can feel such a lonely experience sometimes. It's very solitary when you're sitting, it's like you and your computer and a blank Microsoft Word document. And this was not like that at all. It was fun. We had so much fun doing it. Um 
I write fast anyway, but knowing that faster I get this done, the faster I get sent to Andrew and then get to read his chapter, um, maybe probably a little faster, which maybe wasn't the best for you. <laughs> It was exciting to then get the next part of the story and to see what he did with it. Um, especially because sometimes maybe it wasn't what I would have done, um, or you know, it wasn't the path that I would have taken them, but it was just like really exciting to see the story unfold. Yeah, and I think I mean we wrote a synopsis that was detailed enough so that an editor trusted we could write a story. We had a story there that we could tell, but we were also kind of vague in certain places. Um, like we said, I mean, on Thursday, they do an actor that involves like some sort of plot point. Um, and plot point was defined that the activity was not. So there were chapters I would get, and Nicole at the time was super into roller derby. So suddenly we had a roller derby chapter, and it was great because I didn't know it was coming. So it was exciting to see it. Um, I'm a bigger skater, so I sort of, but like roller derby is a little bit more intense and <laughs> violent than figure skating. Um, so it was fun to see the differences and also just see how this character, who Abigail, I think, didn't, wasn't paying attention when they decided on this activity and never would have agreed to do this um, because there were other options. She could have like tied a shirt or something, but she, was, she ends up. Hi, well, yeah. So that was fun to read too because. You yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I knew there was something happening that would trigger a certain thought point, but I didn't know what what context it was going to be in. Even like you know, just when in an outline, you see like you know these two characters get closer, and then to see like the relationship between Kai and Arin um, kind of develop, and these these two into this little like side romance yeah. was was really rewarding too, and it was really fun to watch developed from my ends because I didn't write the two of them ever together because it wasn't my chat with that, that all unfolded from Kai's side. So to kind of see that, get to see that, each piece of that. Um, and then I remember when we were writing because Kai and Abigail, like they fight at one point and it was like devastating to have to like write and, and then like send it off to you. I'm like, oh, they're so oh sad. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, you know, we had we a lot of fun going back and forth. Do you have a, outside of Abigail and, and Kai, do you have a favorite camper? Oh my gosh. It's like my favorite question because it's like all of them, but no, yeah. I had to pick one. She, so she asked me this question on a, a written. And he so answered like four other names. Yeah, it was like one. a hated thought. <laughs> well, my first one is this one, and I could get away with it. This is right in. <laughs> they weren't cutting us down. Oh my gosh. Um, mm -hmm. We're not tired. Okay, I'm going to pick Bryn this time. I, every time I get asked this question, it's different. But Bryn is a, a trans boy camper who is in Abigail's cabin. Um, I don't think it's come out to his family yet. But, uh, right? No. No. But he's just this wonderful character who's very quiet and soft and gentle. And, and I like seeing that as someone who is trans myself because so often, particularly trans masculine people, feel this need to perform masculinity in a very like overt way and that is not who I am I'm like not to like put gender stereotypes on figure skating but figure skating is not like a like a, <laughs> it's not roller, roller it's not roller roller roller. Roller. <laughs> but yeah and to see Brenda maybe Brenda wants to be more masculine but he was not portrayed that way when Nicole wrote him and I still 100% saw him as a man and, or a boy I suppose at that point and that meant a lot to me. There was also a scene, I'm not going to explain what the scene is so that I don't spoil it for you, but there was a moment where Abigail had helped Bryn for something that related to puberty. And Bryn was really deeply struggling like on an emotional level. And, and I think I helped a little bit with that because I was like, oh my gosh, I'm in my feels. I, I get this. But I didn't know that was coming. It was something that was not in our outline. And I'm like, Monday morning, having had coffee, just sobbing on my desk because I'm <laughs> feeling this so deeply in myself, but yeah, I think Brynn would probably be my favorite today. Um, oh, what about you, though? Did I, I should have, I know, I should have, like, thought about the park and ask you, um, I don't know, oh, maybe Cassidy, if you Cassidy's ask me right, right now, um, again, it could change out any other, because I also want to say Julia, but, uh, also Cassidy, because she's just so excited and loud and proud and happy to be at this camp that like the very first thing she says to, to Abigail is like, I want to miss you. I was just going to tell her that. Yes. She, she, she so excited to be able to like be there and share that with people that she just like screams at her. And Abigail who's like, you know, a little shell shock is like, oh God, like, what is, what is happening right now? Um, 
So I think, yeah, I think Cassidy just because she's got so much energy and so. Um, I'm trying to see if Cassidy even said her name first before. No, she did. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Is it like, I'm Cassidy, I'm Lesbian? Basically, she's like, I'm Cassidy, she, her, below me is Bryn, he, him. And then there's a little paragraph where Abigail's looking at Bryn, um, shorter than Abigail with long shaggy hair. And she's like kind of processing this. She says hi. And then Cassidy goes, I'm a lesbian, <laughs> uh, which absolutely took Abigail by surprise. <laughs> and it took me by surprise. Because I was like, oh, okay. Well, that's Cassidy. So you have, yeah, it, it was fun getting to like write all these different types of queer kids because you have ones like Abigail, who's very, she wants this really badly. She wants to be part of the community. She's not as knowledgeable as some of her queer peers. So she, you know, she's still learning a lot of the vocabulary and whatnot. And then you have someone like Cassidy who's willing to like shout it in your face. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Bryn who's quiet and just kind of like, I'm going to sit back and observe and like, be here, be excited to be here, but I'm not going to, you know, shout about it. Um, Kai doesn't think he belongs at the camp because he's like, this is just who I am. I don't need to like pronounce it. It's everyone else's problem, not mine, but he's also struggling with trust issues because he doesn't have a community that understands him. And then the other people in Kai's cabin have been to camp before. So there's that bit of a dynamic where Kai doesn't feel like he fits in because of that. Uh, and I'm really proud I'm getting his air pronouns right because um, I'm going to mention this, like we kept misgendering Kai during the drafting process, which was an interesting experience for me. Um, Kai is female assigned at birth, but we were misgendering him um, with usually male pronouns. Yeah. Which I which just is don't know what that says about anything. Other than it's interesting. We were having this conversation about gosh, when we start going on tour and talking about these characters, like we better be careful with the pronouns because there, there are a lot of different pronouns. There's um, people with they them pronouns. There's a camp counselor who has any pronouns, which Kai struggles with as someone who really had to search for the right pronouns for himself. There's Siobhan who doesn't use any pronouns, period. Um, yeah, it was... Uh... It was interesting to try and, and navigate all of that um, in writing. Um, and yeah, it was weird because we, anytime we did misgender Kai, it wasn't even the right, wrong part. Like it was, <laughs> um, but it was, I think it was interesting. It was something to, to learn from that, you know, it is something that we had to consider and, and figure out as we went along um, and just be really mindful to get it right. Um, which practice, I mean, yeah, yeah that was kind of the lessons, yes. Yeah. Like, you know, even with something like this, like, you know, with people like us, like, it takes practice, it takes time, and I think, but that's okay. And as long as day to day, we got it right, we're doing our best, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and I feel like, too, as someone who did change his, his or their pronouns, um, a couple years ago, maybe a few years ago now, too, it's it's just a matter of seeing how people react when they do misgender you was interesting to me too because some people freak out about it and then feel bad for the rest of their lives and still <laughs> um and interestingly that made me feel more uncomfortable than almost them just being like they would use she her for me and then be like oh i'm sorry and fix it and move on and i think i mean there's some grace that we need to extend to people who are actually trying i think but and that was kind of a lesson it was like Anytime we did it, we fixed it and moved on. Yeah, yeah, you, and right. you get it right, and you get it right when you're going forward yeah. as best as you can. So. Yeah, yeah. I did find what it was interesting. Um, a lot of people who, a lot of I should say, a lot of cisgender people I've spoken to who have read Camp Quilt Bag and at first were, I don't want to say hung up on Kai's pronouns, but it was a, di a different reading experience for a lot of people. A lot of people who have read the book. Um, and they, you know, they say, you know, I started off and I was like, oh, this is different. This is not what I'm used to. But they were like, by the time I was, you know, halfway near the end, I wasn't even noticing that it was right. anything different anymore. Um, it just felt very normal as it is, but it just felt like I've been reading pronouns like that my whole life kind of thing. And I thought that was really powerful in itself to be able to give someone a book like this and be like, you've never, maybe you've never seen these pronouns before, but by the time you're done with this book, like, they'll just be part of your just another pronoun like the rest of them and hopefully like by reading a book like this you're kind of absorbing how important it is for people to define their own identities and be truly comfortable in their own skin as well which is why i think camps like this are really incredible they definitely didn't exist when i was a kid um, and they do exist there i don't know if everyone here is aware we spoke to the woman named ellen i think who was yeah. part of a, a queer jewish day camp when we were asking initial questions because 
I don't think you said you've never been to like a sleepaway camp. I never been. And most of the camps that I've been to were figure skating related, which were not relevant to this book. <laughs> yeah, so we asked around, you know, what is it? What do you do? You, do? you know, queer specific things at your queer camp. You do regular camp things at your queer camp. Um, um, you asked questions about like kosher food and stuff. Right, yeah, because Orin, one of the characters there, does keep a kosher diet. So I okay. so hyper fixate on that. Very it was just really cool to know that they're to like talk to someone in, about this camp that like exists and there's there's a bunch of them. It's wild. Yeah, it's awesome. But hopefully we get to visit them at some point. <laughs> That'd be really cool. Not quite the season for that yet. But. So, what was your like favorite part to write about? And it could be anything character moment, a scene, a character. Oh my goodness. Oh, that's a spoiler. I can't stop. <laughs> always the worst with that at book events. I always like tell everyone the whole plot. <laughs> I'm super trying not to, but I can't use that because that's definitely a spoiler. I'm trying to think back. I mean, I will say this is the first character that I've written that was kind of a prickly pear, like super grumpus for most of the book. And that was a lot of fun because usually when I was getting your chapters, I had high coffee. It was Monday morning and I was like, I just finished a chapter literally yesterday and I'm like that on deadline. Uh, so I really like embraced the channel. But it was fun because you kept commenting, you're like, gosh, Kai is super grumpy. And I was like, so is your writer. <laughs> That was fun because Abigail to me was just had this humorous voice. She didn't think she was funny or anything, but a lot of the times she did were hilarious just because she was panicking most of the time about things. Like, yes, I don't think this was in our initial draft when we sold it, but I kind of decided like we needed to have an albino squirrel that was like a myth of camp. And so this wasn't in the original chapter three, but by the time you revised it, there were. There was artwork, I think, of the, the squirrel, like a white squirrel in the cafeteria, and Abigail's panicking because she's like, Are squirrels gay icons? I didn't know this. Oh my god, like, what is the squirrel stand for? Which is a camp. No, so the there is an albino squirrel, um, mixed nuts for in the book. <laughs> it's this like mythical, um. Like if you see the squirrel, you get like good luck or something. Yeah, like it's like the like, like, yeah, camp books. Yeah. Um, and we sold the book without the squirrel in it or anything. We sold it in our office. Never did. So she's just probably well. <laughs> but, yeah. So we added added one albino squirrel after. <laughs> and I now I've gotten like people commenting on my post showing their albino squirrels from their neighborhoods and stuff, which is not kind of fun. <laughs> should we, should yeah. we open it up to if anyone has any questions? We can keep talking, but. Yeah, um, <laughs> we can probably talk. Yes. Um, I have to ask about the Stacy's mom found kind of the way in reference. <laughs> uh, was Abigail's crush always uh, Stacy's mom or was that was that their yeah. as a <laughs> So um, my short story, and this is all rainbow, which is an Abigail short story, um, is Stacy's mom. It's called Stacy's mom, and it's about her crush on Stacy's mom. And I literally went into like we were talking about what we were gonna write for our short stories for This Is Our Rainbow, and my co-editor was like, "Oh, like I think maybe something like this. Like, what do you think?" And I'm like, "I'm gonna write a queer Stacy's mom," and I knew that right off the bat. So I kind of developed everything else just around that reference um and i don't know that many people like none of the children understand this reference no. um, and it's kind of, it makes me feel old but um anytime someone's like oh my god like the song like, yes. but the adults like it yeah like my my cousin's around my age and she thought she started playing stacy's mom in the car for her kid who no. never heard it before when we had our first zoom with uh, christina who's our editor it was like one of the first things she said to me was like, oh my God, Stacy's mom. I was like, yeah, <laughs> yes, Stacy's mom. And so, uh, yeah, so that was 100% different. And anyone who doesn't know the song Stacy's mom, please go listen to it. <laughs> Maybe don't, if you've got younger kids, don't watch the music video. because. But if you're home, by that, yourself, watch yeah. My <laughs> cousin put on music videos like, and I think my nine-year-old second cousin saw it, and she was like, wow, that was racier than I really realized. So it was going to be legit. Like, Yes. Yeah. Not those ones that I watched on loops. <laughs> I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> it was catchy, okay? It was like on now. That's what I call music number thirty-two or something. The CD. So 
If you yeah. have, anyone remembers those CDs. I have now. <laughs> oh, did you? I did not. I was like, well, look, yeah, you're having a moment. Yeah. <laughs> I might still have one of those CDs. I don't have a CD player anymore. I probably still have the CD somewhere. Other, anyone else have any questions? Yeah, I'll I have to know what activities would y'all do at K Camp? Oh my gosh, at K Camp. Well, I would, I would definitely do, they make friendship bracelets like they're the ones we both have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would definitely be, I was always the person who's making friendship bracelets like on the beach and stuff. So I definitely would do that. I would do roller derby. Yeah, I would probably try roller derby and die thinking I knew how to do it because I could skate. But I, for my 30th birthday, I went to a roller rink at the Church of Eight Wheels in San Francisco, which is in a literal church. I don't think it's the same where, but I was like, all right, I'm going to do some spins. And I'm like, yeah. um, I'm lucky I didn't end up in track. Then. But honestly, um, I would probably, I, I don't know how to cook or bake. Um, and there were editorial notes associated with this in the book. Um, I would probably try to make fried pizzas, which is something they do in the book where they choose ingredients that have like, like pineapple is yellow and part of the fries like and stuff like that. that, was, that was I don't know if I would eat my fried pizza after I made it, but I would try to make it. My other favorite thing about that we got because you did you got called out and they're like you don't know how to make pizza. <laughs> 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 mac and cheese. Come on. Yeah. Um, but the other thing was we learned how bad they were at math because they're <laughs> each so they're yeah. doing in camp they're doing a competition like the whole thing is each cabin is pitted up for the competition and you get points for each activity that your yeah. cabin basically does. Here's one of the points. Pages. So like the points add up. And like every other, every time that we have one of these pages, our copy editor was like, you have no idea how many points are you just making up numbers. <laughs> how, how much is each activity worth? And I was like, how? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, you just take our own for it. <laughs> so I volunteered this tribute. I mean, it was our own fault because we were the ones who put it in the draft that have the, the numbers. So then they were like, of course, we need to actually know that these are accurate. And I was like, why? <laughs> Can't we just won't they just take our word for it that like purple cabins ahead this day? You know, they would not. No, so. they, wanted, they wanted actual. So I volunteered as tribute, and I had like my little phone calculator and a piece of paper trying to keep all track of all this stuff. But. It's another reason why co-authoring is great because I didn't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but also, please don't look at those things. I mean, because we might still. Be, I don't. So for those who don't know, copy edits are when you've gone through edits, you've gone through regular edits, and then a copy editor basically like calls you out on everything. <laughs> called you out on everything. So, right. I used to think I was good at grammar and then I went to copy edits. And I, <laughs> I used to think I knew what day of the week it was when I was writing a manuscript and then copy edits told me that I did not. Yeah. Uh, so they basically like they correct your grammar and structure your writing structures and, and all the, the facts, the timeline and stuff. Um, but my favorite, we were talking about this earlier um, because again, Kai is Minnesota. Um, Yale's in New Jersey. Um, one of the things that I always write, and I don't know how many of you guys are from New Jersey, but the thing that we say is like, I'm waiting online for something, right? Like, mm -hmm. I'm waiting online. I, I have to get online for this XYZ. But I guess everyone else says I'm waiting in line for XYZ. Um, but so anytime, my copy editors are always like, you, you mean in line, and then my editor who I've worked with forever now is like, she's from Jersey, you can keep <laughs> <laughs> So I fight for it every time, so in, in Camp Colbeck, in the Abigail Challenge, it will say online, but if there's any in ties, it'll say in line, because yeah. it's cold. That's from Minnesota, mm -hmm. yeah, and so, I don't think we ever mentioned it, but I would have said pop instead of soda. <laughs> they have been mentioned, you know. Oh, uh, yeah, little things like that is, is what copy edits call you online. How bad at math? Yeah. Any other questions? Huh? Is there anything that you learned from this co authoring writing process that you then kind of took into your own individual projects? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if it's actually been effective, but. Um... This sounds weird since I did say we wrote from the synopsis, but I kind of, by talking to Nicole and learning about her process, I'm trying to allow myself to not stick so closely to an outline going forward because when Nicole gets an idea, she just runs with it, like a pantser does, and figures out things at thought points along the way as she goes. Whereas 
like my last project that I wrote that's coming out next year, I wrote from, I sold it on like five chapters and a synopsis and struggled when I, I, I found that I'm very good at writing synopses that sound like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and then when I actually try to write it, they don't work at all. So, but I was like, no, this is what's sold. This is what has to, you know, so like three kids came out within like three chapters of each other. It was just, it was a mess. And I feel like if I had been like, what would Nicole do? Like WWND, <laughs> I, I maybe would have not had to rewrite the whole thing like two months later. So I'm trying to kind of embrace spontaneity a little bit more in my writing. And it's funny because I feel like I'm going the other way where I'm trying to like, we're, we've met in the middle really well, um, where, you know, when you pant sometimes like some, for me, I hit the middle sometimes and I'm like, I, I don't know. I know where I need to get, but I don't really know how I'm getting there. Um, and it was just so nice knowing where we were going and to be able to develop everything around that, that now I try and think ahead a little more than I, than I was, um, just making me a little faster of a writer. <laughs> but, um, so now I'm kind of thinking ahead more than just staying where I am so that I can kind of think about where I need to go a little more. Um, a little more specifically, so I don't hit as many pitfalls as I think I had been. Because um, I also, I draft short, um, and then builds is how I always do, and then you draft big. I draft and big and try to make it, sometimes end. it doesn't actually get smaller after I draft, but yeah, I, I usually overdraft and then have to start pulling. So we're also out. different in that way, and I think I learned a lot about like how to, how to figure out those missing pieces faster and, and more more deliberately as I'm drafting. So yeah, I think we just, we met in the middle really, yeah. really well, well, thankfully. I know I'm, I'm also kind of shy when I'm drafting, like I don't want to share or seem like, what if this idea is dumb? Whereas when you're drafting and you get stuck on something, you're like, I need to find a way to get this character to do, to this point, I don't need a middle. And you, even I, if I can't think of anything, you're just talking it out with me usually in text. And I was like, I need to do that more because a lot of times when I, do that with my partner he doesn't actually offer any solutions but by thinking about it passively I kind of come to my own solutions and I'm like thank you so much and he's like okay um well it's like we're on so I don't know if we said but so we are on different coasts San yeah. is the Bay Area in California so, um, so sometimes I'm, I'm texting him like oh I need help with xyz and I'm talking it out and he's like sleeping or like, he's not awake yet and by the time he wakes up I'm like thanks so much for yeah, it's not hard to figure it out so yeah, just you know, I think I think that's why I worked right in camp so well too, just because we had already had that dynamic where we were bouncing things off of each other. So then to do it and writing the same thing was just made it even easier because we knew exactly where we were coming from. And it's fun to have someone who knows your characters as well as you do. Uh, usually when you're talking about your book with critique partners or friends, they kind of have a general sense of what you're talking about, but they they don't know as well as you do but with this like, we had to make these decisions early on to sell the book so we knew kind of the journey of each character that we wanted them to take and we could kind of help get them there other questions i think we can probably um well happy to sign any books that you guys have if anyone wants to ask us questions you come up and chat with us but uh, thank you all so much for coming Yeah. Andrew wants would love it if you guys could all like like like, we're, like it's a yearbook and you're signing at the end of the year. If you guys could all sign sign this book. Yeah, yeah. I would love that. I'd be honored, and I'll, I'll sign yours too if you want. <laughs> you played a reverse card. Yeah, it wasn't my idea. It was one of my agents' clients. So. Taylor and right now Kate Kevin Beck Bakewell does that and shared a picture and I was like that's the coolest idea ever so yeah, that's where that came from. Thank, Thank you so you much Nicole. Thank you everyone. Thanks to everyone who joined us online. Oh,